they wake up one morning to find out that they've been compromised for two and a half years and they have over 150 million records of clients that have been compromised and exposed. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. To me, cybersecurity is one of the most exciting fields on the planet. And if we narrow that down even more, being a CISO or Chief Information Security Officer is probably one of the most exciting, coolest, yet very demanding roles that are out there. And what's interesting is while it's been around for a while, it's still actively evolving in many organizations. So what exactly is a CISO? A CISO is somebody at the executive level that's typically equal to the chief information officer who's responsible for making sure the board, the company, and the CEO understand and are aware of security, what are the high-level threats and exposures, what could be the financial impact to the business, and put together a strategic plan for cybersecurity to make sure that it's properly implemented across an organization. So a chief information security officer is really focused on the overall strategy, making sure there's awareness and making sure in my opinion that there's no surprises because that's the biggest problem today organizations have with cybersecurity. They're not knowing what they don't know. They get surprised and that's never good. You see a lot of these companies that are spending a lot of money in cybersecurity, they have staff, they have certifications, they have well-trained individuals, they think they're doing everything great, they think everything's good, and then boom, they wake up one morning to find out that they've been compromised for two and a half years, and they have over 150 million records of clients that have been compromised and exposed. That shouldn't happen. Right? Organizations should have proper visibility, proper metrics, so this way they can go in and be able to catch attacks early. My role when I've been a CISO, and I've been doing this work for over 20 years, I'll give you my background in a little bit, but I just want to get through our introduction of what are we really focused on here with being a CISO. And one of the things I realized is you can't prevent all attacks if you have functionality. If you wanna be in business, then you're going to have to make trade-offs. What I always like to describe when I talk with executives and I'm training up CISOs is you can absolutely achieve 100% security. I, I remember when that hit me, because I do a lot of keynotes and I'm on a lot of stages, and I have slide presentations that I use but when I go and give a presentation, I sort of have the general milestones that I want to speak on, but I sort of feel the audience. I listen to what they want, their questions, and I sort of adapt as I go. So a lot of times I'm even surprising myself, right? Because I want to make sure I'm giving them real authentic information. I remember about a year and a half ago, I'm on stage in Florida, about 2,000 people in the audience and one of my slides that I've presented hundreds of times pops up and it says 100% security doesn't exist. And normally the previous times when I presented, I went and said, you can't achieve 100% security. It's not possible. For some reason, and I don't know why, on this particular occasion, I sort of looked at the slide, looked at the audience, and I said, is that really true? Is it actually a true statement that you cannot achieve 100% security? And you had a little chatting back and forth. And somebody said, well, yes, well, no. I said, well, let's do an experiment. So I pulled up my cell phone and I said, can we make this cell phone 100% secure? And somebody said, well, turn it off. So I said, okay. And then somebody said, but you can turn it back on again. So somebody else in the back screamed, smash it with a hammer. 
So I said, okay. So if I turn it off and smash my cell phone with a hammer, is it now 100% secure? And I kid you not. There was somebody in the third row that said, well, you can glue it back together. I'm like, dude, really? I said, you're really doing this? Come on, man. Right? And I said, okay. So, so what do we need to do? And he gets almost a little too excited. He's like, light it on fire. He goes, burn it with fire, with lighter fluid. And I'm like, okay, that's a little, that's a little weird there. So I, I look at my bodyguards. So I'm like, keep that dude away from me later. Right? A little, little, little weird there. But I said, okay, well, let's play along. So if I take my cell phone, I turn it off, I smash it to pieces with a hammer, I put lighting fluid on it, and I light it on fire and burn it to a crisp. I then looked at the audience with a little smirk and said, can we now all agree that this is 100% secure? And they said, yes. I said, so that slide behind me is not actually correct. You absolutely can achieve 100% security. So 100% security is achievable. And you started seeing people get antsy. They said, I know where you're going. I said, but here's the problem. What is the value of that cell phone to me? And they all said, zero. So I said, so if we achieve 100% security, then there's no value, there's no benefit, or as I like to say, there's no functionality. So the reality is, in any organization, you're going to go in and you're going to have 100% security and zero functionality. What this means, and this is probably one of the most important pieces of being a CISO, is every time you add functionality, you're decreasing security. Every time you're adding a new server or adding a new application or adding a new account or adding anything that enhances the organization or provides additional functionality, your security is decreasing. You're always making that trade-off. Now, if we push this all the way down, you get to the bottom where you have zero security and 100% functionality. One of my big things in security, when I was a CISO and I trained CISOs, is avoid extremes. You never want to be at one extreme or the other. Because guess what? If you're at either extreme, you're going to go out of business because you can't function in that manner. So the trick is to find that balance, to find that balance where you have just the functionality that's needed and you're optimizing your security to have proper visibility. So here's one of the best tips. Most organizations, when they make decisions, actually most individuals for that matter, when they make decisions, they ask one question. And that one question is, what is the value or benefit? And if there's value or there's benefit, we tend to decide to do things. So what is the value or benefit of setting up this new server? Well, we can increase revenue by 15%. What is the value or benefit by giving an employee an exception and allowing them to have USB drives and plug them into their computer, even though the corporate policy bans it and says you not, are not allowed to have USB drives unless you get written authority from your boss. So those are all areas where people come in, there's functionality, there's value, there's benefit, and they make a decision. Here's the problem. It could be a good decision, or it could be a very, very bad decision, but it all depends on a second question. And that second question is, what is the risk or exposure by doing this? So let's look at an example. If we go in and an employee comes up to us and says, if you sign a waiver and allow me to have USB access to my computer, I can increase my productivity by 20%. Now, as a boss, having somebody increase their productivity and get 20% more work done, that's awesome, right? Bring it, bring it, bring it. But here's the question. What is the risk or exposure? What if this person works in a controlled environment, they're going to use it just to move data within the organization, this is a very trustworthy individual, they always follow the policy, they've never had any issues, never had any breaches, and never had any major problems or performance issues to the company. In that case, it actually might be a good decision 
because the risk is relatively low. But on the other hand, what if the information is going to be very, very, very sensitive corporate information that's going to be put on the USB and they're going to be traveling around the world with it where they could potentially you lose the USB. It's not encrypted. There's no protection on it. And this employee fails phishing attacks has been known to violate security policies and have been written up multiple times to the organization. Now, all of a sudden, that's probably a really bad decision because the risk is too great and the risk is too impactful. So notice, whether you should give an employee USB access and sign a waiver, it's not binary, it's not yes or no, it depends on the risk. If the risk is low, then it might be yes. If the risk is really, really high, then it might be no, but you only know by asking that second question. So it's important that when you're making business decisions, you don't go in and just make it yes or no. And I've seen CISOs that are not very successful. Well, if anybody comes and says, we need to do this or we need to do that, and it involves any server or any data or any information, we are always going to say no. And the problem with that approach is today, if somebody goes in and asks, can we do this in the name of security? And your response without understanding the high level details is no. All they're going to do is do it anyway and not invite you to the meeting. Right, So it's important that we change our approach to security. The old school approach that I was originally taught when I worked at the CIA doesn't work anymore. I remember when I started working at the CIA in the late 80s, early 90s, and I worked for the security department, and I was a very junior employee. And one of the very senior folks said, Eric, I'm going to train you up. He goes, let's go for a walk. And he goes, here's how it's going to work. He goes, Eric, we're going to send you to a lot of meetings where they're proposing new ideas. They're proposing new concepts and new things. And I want you to sit in that meeting. I want you to take very detailed notes. And when they ask you, is this okay or is this approved or is this acceptable from a cybersecurity perspective? He goes, I want you to do this deep thought look. Pause a couple of seconds and then say no. Say, no, it's not acceptable. And he goes, most of the time, they'll go away because they're crazy ideas, and if security doesn't approve it, they're not going to go anywhere. He goes, in some cases, though, you might be invited to a second meeting. And in that second meeting, I want you to review your notes beforehand and ask a few questions. Ask some questions so it sounds like you're engaged and involved. And then as the meeting goes through, they're going to ask you again. But this new information and this new data, is this now approved from a security perspective? And same thing, I want you to sort of look down a little, nod your head, look up and smile, and go no. And he goes, most of the projects will then end at that point. He goes, but in the rare occasions that they invite you back to a third meeting, then I want you to go through the same process, but this time I want you to say we'll consider it and then come back and present it to me and the team, and then we'll take a look at it and decide how to proceed. Now, in the late 80s, early 90s, we could debate whether that approach to security was effective, but, but it did work for the most part, and it did get the job done. Today, where technology runs businesses very quick and very fast, it doesn't work. Because as I said, if somebody asks you if they can do something and you immediately say no, they will not invite you to the meeting. They will do it anyway, and they will go behind your back. So therefore, it's critical as a chief information security officer, when they ask questions to say, well, it depends on the information, because let's face it, any functionality, if it's done in certain ways, can be way too high a risk and unacceptable. And if it's done in other ways, can actually be very, very acceptable. So it's really not a yes or no question. And you might go, oh, but Eric, What if it's a situation where they want to allow sensitive, proprietary customer information to be accessible from the internet? Once again, have you ever heard of online banking? Online banking is, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, is very secure. 
They have many layers of protection. They have many layers of isolation. The data is never directly accessible, but in reality, that's what they're doing. So with the right design architecture and mitigating risks, you could potentially take any functionality request and make it good or bad, make it secure or not secure, depending on the factors and components. So it's important as a chief information security officer that you recognize that. Because if you're one of those people that always say no, you always say things aren't allowed, you always say you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, then you're not going to be very successful. Your job as a chief information security officer is to control the damage and timely detection of attacks. The goal of security is not to stop all attacks. You are going to be compromised. Any business you work for is going to have a breach. Your job as a CISO is to survive the breach. How do you survive the breach so when it does occur, you still have a job? Because the problem is, in most companies, when a breach happens, when a breach occurs, what's the playbook say? The playbook says, fire the CISO. That's why you see CISOs have such a high turnover rate in the industry is because as soon as a breach happens, they're going to get fired. And as we go through this series on life of a CISO, I'm gonna give you lots of tips and tricks to show how you can survive a breach, how you can make sure that when a breach occurs, you'll be able to survive it by putting the proper metrics in place. And that's gonna be for a future episode, but I just want to tease that out so you keep listening uh, to this series and you keep getting the tips and tricks you need to be an effective CISO. So point is, with a CISO cybersecurity, is not about being 100% secure. It's not about preventing attacks. It's not about never being breached. It's all about visibility. Prevention is ideal, detection is a must, and timely detection of attacks. If you have a breach and you detect it within a few weeks and a 50 or 100 records have been compromised, in most cases, I consider that acceptable. But if you have a breach where it's gone undetected for three years, and 150 million records have been compromised, something's failed. Something is not working correctly there because you should have the visibility to be able to do timely detection. And just wrapping up, the way you do that with this one section is by asking better questions. Most people ask the single question, what is the benefit? What is the value? But what I want you to start asking is two additional questions. What is the risk and can I live with that risk? Is that an acceptable level of risk? The way I train up all my CISOs is in any situation, you're always asking three questions. What is the value or benefit? What is the risk or exposure? And is that risk or exposure acceptable? And are there ways to mitigate or reduce it? Now, what's interesting is this approach, strategic approach to cybersecurity I've been using for approximately 10 years. I built it and developed it, and it's what I used to be very, very successful when I was a CISO in many companies and in consulting with our clients. And one of the things I do is I love reading. I'm always reading. I read anywhere from one to two books a week because it's one of the best resources out there for learning from others. And last year, I started reading some books from Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett, He's a little bit of a slacker. I think he's the sixth or seventh richest person. I mean, come on, Warren. You're not even in the top three, man. Come on. No, I'm joking. I, right? Warren Buffett's a pretty good dude, right? Pretty smart dude, pretty impressive dude. Very, very rich person. Very, very, very successful investor. And when I was reading all his books, I noticed similarities. The way he invests is by asking three similar questions. When Warren Buffett is going to make an investment, he's always going to ask, what is the upside? What is the downside? And can I live with the downside? Warren Buffett's investment strategy is all about minimizing or reducing the downside. It's minimize or reducing the risk. If something has an amazing upside, but it has a really, really bad downside, he won't invest in it. That's why Warren Buffett doesn't like Bitcoins. That's why he's never, ever invested in Bitcoins because he says, yes, the upside is ridiculous, ridiculously high. 
The problem is you can lose everything. The downside is just as significant. So because it has such a huge downside, even though the upside is great, he doesn't invest. And I think we could see being one of the most successful billionaires in the world, his strategy works. So I found it funny that my strategy that I developed independently for approaching security and organizations directly aligns with the philosophies and thoughts of Warren Buffett. That's why I always jokingly say, my methodology is endorsed by Warren Buffett. I don't think he agrees with that, but it's still a fun one to say. But it's interesting when you can validate and verify the processes and procedures that you're using. So a CISO is somebody who's gonna understand the strategy, minimize the risk to an acceptable level, but allow the business to function and be successful. This is probably one of the other big misconceptions. Many people talk about cybersecurity as a disenabler. It stops the business. I remember when I do executive awareness sessions, I go in and I ask all the executives. Most of you have heard of cybersecurity. Most of you know the term cybersecurity. I said, so what do you think of when you think cybersecurity? If your kid came up to you today after work and said, hey, what'd you do today? And you said, I went to a cybersecurity awareness briefing and they asked you, what is cybersecurity? What would your answer be? How would you respond? And it's funny because I get things like it's stopping attackers, it's protecting critical data, it's managing risk. And I remember one that I'll always remember that was a chief operating officer of a very large company. He says, Eric, when I think of cybersecurity, you're the people that stop me from doing things. You're the people that disrupt the business. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. But in my mind, that shouldn't be the case. If you do security correctly, cybersecurity should be a business enabler. It should enable your business to be as successful as possible. If you're involving security, then you should make sure that the projects and everything is always very successful. This was one of my firm beliefs. And I remember for a large telecommunication company, I was their first CISO in the mid 90s. And as security got more important and I was hiring more people, here's what I always told my team. I said, when security gets invited to meetings and security is involved in a project, there's two rules I want you to always follow. First, don't say no. Always be open, always be honest. There's always ways to do things. It might turn out to be too expensive. It might turn out to be too complex, but there's always a way. So don't say no and get shut out. And then second, you do anything you can to make that project successful. And remember back in the 90s, a lot of people in security were engineers. They were engineers or sysadmins that were making career changes and switching over. And I remember one engineer came to me and goes, Eric, I'm working on this project and right now they're short staffed on the architectural design piece and configuring the routers. I have a background in this area and I can spend two days and get the project back on track. But it's not my job description and it's not what I'm doing today. And I looked at him and said, do it. I said, you do anything to make the project successful. And that was always my criteria. Now, here's the interesting thing. Three years later, I get called in to the CEO's office. And I get called in. And remember, this is back in the 90s when you weren't at that executive level, right? You were still buried under IT, uh, even though as a chief information security officer, you weren't at that high level. So this was not something normal, especially one-on-ones. So I'm like, uh-oh, what happened, right? I'm, I'm going in there positive, but a little nervous going, what's happened? And I remember he, he sits down with me and he goes, Eric, as you know, we're a fast growing startup and we have over 300 projects that we've run over the last three years. We average anywhere from 100 to 120 projects a year. I said, yes, I'm aware of that. And he goes, and I noticed that some projects were highly successful and others weren't. Some went over budget and others stayed within budget. 
Some were delivered on time and some went way over on schedule. He goes, so recently I tasked my team to look at all the projects that were successful, that were delivered on time and within or under budget and find the commonalities of all those projects. He goes, there were actually over the 300 we worked on, there were 37. And he goes, you know what answer they told me? Cybersecurity was involved. He goes, the 37 projects that cybersecurity was involved with were all done on time within budget and were very successful. All the projects that cybersecurity wasn't involved with were not successful over budget or ended up failing. And he goes, why is that the case? And I sort of smiled. And I was like, because security is awesome. Right, no, no, that, that, that's what I wanted to say, right? I wanted to say because cybersecurity is the future. Right? But I didn't, I said, it's very simple. I believe that cybersecurity is an integral part of the business. I believe this company will not be successful if we don't embed cybersecurity into every process. Therefore, my view is cybersecurity is a business enabler. It helps the business more effectively do what they're supposed to. And therefore, I told my team that when we get involved with projects, we're not roadblocks, we're not disruptive, we don't cause problems. We engage, we work as a team, and we do everything to make it successful. And he looked at me and he said, that's never how I would have defined cybersecurity. He goes, but that makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, not many others have viewed it that way. And that's why there's been lots of trouble with security and not as many CISOs have been successful. But trust me, from the mid 90s, when I was one of the first CISOs to today, that's the key to success. Be a business enabler and do anything, and I mean anything, to make the project successful. And this brings up one other key point that I wanna make sure I address, and that's this. If security negatively impacts the business, security is wrong. If you hurt the business, if you hurt revenue, it is always wrong. And I know that struggles because I, I have engineers going, Eric, but I'm 100% right. You're 100% right, but you're completely and totally wrong. And let me explain. We had a project that we worked on where the business unit came to us and said, we want to set up these servers and we want to put all the corporate data on it and they didn't want to put protections and they didn't want to do anything. We said, listen, I know you want to do this, but you need to spend the money on security. What you're doing is insane. It's crazy. This is a $3 million project, not a 300K. You're cutting corners by removing all of the security components. This is not secure. This is going to put us in a huge, huge risk situation. And what did they do? They went in and they did the project anyway. They went and ordered $300,000 worth of equipment. They set up the equipment and then when we did our security scans, we found the equipment on the network. And my team went crazy. And my team's like, we're gonna rip it off the network, blah, 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 blah. Here's the problem. If I went in and I said, this is not acceptable and we're gonna disconnect the server and we're gonna cost the company $300,000, I would be wrong. I probably would have got fired for doing that. But here's the problem. If I didn't do anything and I just rolled over, there would have been a breach in six months and I would have got blamed because that's how it works, right? They have all of the uh, authority and you have all the responsibility. So I did something very, very unique at the time and as another foundational item. I transferred the risk. I went to the executives and I said, listen, business unit X has decided to pursue a project and not involve us not listen to our recommendations, and they've already spent $300,000. I'm not gonna stop the project because that would be a bad use of corporate resources, but I wanna transfer all the risk over to that vice president. I want that vice president to sign off and assume all the risk so if a breach, if a compromise occurs, they're responsible, not us. And they said, but Eric, if it's exposed and vulnerable, how do we fix it? And I said, oh, that's very easy. I presented the list to that executive and they decided not to do it. So then that VP was called in 
And they said, we heard that security provided a list to allow you to be more functionally rich and enabler and be more secure. And they said, oh, no, no, it's not needed. It's not necessary. My team says it's just uh, unnecessary overhead. So we decided not to do it. And they looked back at me. I said, I don't agree. But like I said, we're going to transfer all the risk to that vice president. And now if a breach or an issue occurs, they are fully responsible because they don't think it's an issue and I do. And the CEO said, that's fair. As you can imagine, that vice president didn't like that. They liked the old way where they could do anything they want and I got fired. So as you can imagine in that case, one week later, the vice president called us in and says, we're gonna implement all your recommendations. Can you help us? Exactly. That's how you win at security. You don't disrupt the business. You don't go in and say no, but you go in and you give your opinions you show them how to do it securely. You do everything to make them successful. And if they don't want to listen to you, you transfer the risk. You transfer the risk over to them. And that's how you go and successfully run a business. So as we go in and we wrap up this edition of how to be a CISO, right? The CISO moment, right? Tricks and tips from the, pit, from the bullpen, right? Into and cybersecurity. Last thing I want to talk about is strategy versus tactics. If you're going to be a CISO, it's all about strategy. You are not a tactical position. The problem we run into when we look at the life of a CISO is that many people come from technical backgrounds. They're security engineers and they're people that come up from the ranks and they like doing technical. So as soon as something goes wrong, as soon as there's a problem, as soon as there's an issue, they roll up their sleeves and they start getting into tactics. You are not going to be successful by doing that. I remember one CISO said, Eric, I can't spend any time on strategy because here's my day. I wake up in the morning and I get to work about 7.30. I check some email, I plan my day, and then the fires start. And we spend all day putting out fires, putting out fires, putting out fires, putting out fires. And when most of the fires are done, at about 6.30 to 7 p.m., I go home and it repeats. I have zero time to work on strategy. And I looked at him and said, okay, you've set yourself up to be a bad position, but here's how you fix it. What's the current size of your team? He says, it's me and four engineers. And I said, and all five of you spend 12 to 14 hours a day on tactics putting out fires. Yes, here's the solution. Starting next Monday, Half your team just got laid off and you got ta double tasked. So now you have two team members and only four hours of your time a day to put out fires. I said, if that's the reality, if two of your team members got laid off and you got given another position so you can only be your CISO firefighter half time, you would have to get by. He goes, I guess. I said, so great. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to spend two and a half of your resources on just putting out the fires. And then the other half of your time and your two other engineers, you're gonna be spending on strategy. Now, will some fires burn a little longer? Will some fires not get put out? Absolutely. But now you'll be able to put together a strategy and get ahead of the game. Because let's face it, if you never get a strategy in place, you're never gonna be able to put out the fires. And a simple example of that with this client is most of the fires they were putting out were patching systems that weren't patched. They were reactively trying to apply patches, get systems up to date, everything else. The problem, they never had time to build a configuration management strategy. After three months of doing my plan, they not only had a configuration management strategy with centralized patching and checks and controls and metrics, but 60% of the fires were gone because they were able to get ahead of the game. So that's the trick. If you're spending all your time on tactics, you got to break the cycle. You got to break those bad patterns and you got to put measures in place to start getting proactive and focusing on strategy. If you want to be a successful CISO, it's all about strategy, working with the executives and being a business enabler. This is Dr. Eric Cole and I hope you enjoyed this edition of Life of a CISO. And if you would like more information or details, please visit us at www.secure-anchor.com.